here, right? So we are looking at the syllabus. I think I made mention of this last week. Um, and it seemed to be that some people didn't know what I was talking about, right? So I'll just spend, if I could just spend like one or two minutes on this, hopefully not to overdo it, right? So here you have a look at your syllabus. And um, let me just get it back for you here. And what you'll notice is that for those of us who haven't seen it, now this is free on the Nibosh website. You just have to get into your subject, click resources and click certificate and you will be able to get this syllabus. So what you'll see um, is that we are finished with element one. We are finished with element two. Element two, if you look at the number of hours, was two hours and we did take two hours. We did take two sessions to finish element two and that would have been an hour, um, you know, long anyway. Element one would have taken us more than a month because it was an hour long and that could have really taken us about five or six sessions. I can't exactly remember the number of sessions. But we are here, we are in element three. And uh, this is the start of the chapter with culture. But if you look at the hours for it, it's the longest chapter it has, right? And um, just in case, it's the first time that you are seeing this syllabus in a long time, maybe you haven't seen it in a long time, um, from the day of orientation anyway, the exam only examines up to element four, right? So it's only up to element four that it is relevant to your exam. If you wonder then what happened to the rest of it, like some of us have two books, right? And what happened to the other book? How come we are teaching that? But the thing is that is for the practical, look at right here, so the practical and it's open book practical. So you have to use the book in doing the practical, right? I'll show you how to do that once we get into the practical. So the exam, uh, I mean, I always say, and I said it last week, to me, it's not very hard. You have had one handout for this lesson so far, and you had one handout for this so far. And today, where well, we would have emailed most of you this handout already, right? This one, though, elementary has a couple of handouts, maybe about three for the most, but we'll be starting it today. And just in case, Sam, like I said, you are seeing this for the first time, and this will go on the YouTube channel, so I could often uh, just review it anyway. As you scroll along the syllabus, you'll see the fine details of what you have to know. Let me just scroll along a bit. You'll, find, you'll see this, the fine details and what you have to know. So we can probably use element two as an example. I may have gone too fast there. Let me just add my Darian. And I'll come back to element two, right? So if you, uh, if you have any doubts, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that you should have any doubts at all. But um, if you know if anybody wonders, you know, are we going along the line of the syllabus or whatever have you? Uh, but we have finished with element two, so I'm trying to get back two, so you'll see, right? So if you so if I can get back element two, the FAM, right? So you'll see if you read this, the minute is gonna clear the the drawings there, right? If you read that, you you would realize that that's everything we did in element two. The basics of the health and safety management system plan do check out. Now, this lesson is on YouTube as well. And then, of course, we'd have been mentioned the ISO 45001 and asked you to learn four elements in it um, like policy, leadership, um, contractor management. That is on the handout for that lesson, anyway, right? Um, the benefits of having a certified management system is exactly what the syllabus required, is what you did. And then here you have the different pieces of the policy, right? This would have been, um, well, I would say the last week and the week before, that would have been some of those lessons anyway. So if you look at it at a value, at a service value, you have the statement of intent, right? You have, in a you read, you're gonna find things like the rules and responsibilities and then the arrangements of the word down here. So have no fear, um, just in case you have not been looking at the syllabus, um, the PowerPoints that we give you all and the way I teach is directly on the syllabus. So today, as we get into today's class, what are you gonna see? We have to look at the meaning of the term health and safety culture. We're gonna look at the relationship between health and safety culture and health and safety performance. And then we're gonna look at some indicators of health and safety culture, of which the indicators are on this slide here already. So today, I think we may just get into uh, 3.1. 
I think by that time it may be coming to half past one anyway, right? We may not get into 3.2, but just to let you see that, I mean, once you cover the work on the syllabus, it's important that you go and you learn it, uh, or, or at least you have an idea where to find it in the case of the project anyway, right? So let me go straight into the handout now. Well, just keep in mind what you're going to cover. You're going to cover example, the definition of health and safety culture. It's right there. You're going to look at the relationship between culture and uh, safety performance. And then something called indicators of health and safety culture. And perhaps even today, how could your peers influence health and safety culture, right? So at least you have the syllabus there. Um, of course, you could probably, when you get some time in the week, try to download it as well right but um trust me when i say when once you have the handout you are on good footing anyway right you are you are not really um you know to say that you are being disadvantaged in any way the handout typically is the whole um syllabus written basically in point form right so just to try to get all this to line up here right and it will make us start right so we're looking at the health and safety culture and the very first slide would have the definition of culture, right? So this is the, the, the objectives you just saw from the syllabus. What is the definition of culture? How could it be improved? And the, the same thing you saw on the syllabus, right? The revision here would have been from last week. Make sure you know the different parts of the health and safety policy. If not, um, you can't get it on the YouTube channel. Um, and you can hear it over and over again anyway, right? So for the first one, we have to look what is meant by the term health and safety culture. And again, I mean, most of you who know that I do a lot of explanation and, and, and of course reading if it's important, but of course the explanation I think is way more important, right? So in terms of, in terms of culture, the first thing I'll say is that if you're looking at this for the very first time is that you have to learn the second definition by heart. Right, and once you learn that, well, that wouldn't be today, of course, that'd be something to do in your free time. Um, the next thing is to understand what is meant by the term culture, and um, like an everyday basis, then, right? So, what I'll tell you before I read the definition so that you'll understand what the lesson is all about is that, um, culture they say is whatever goes wrong in your company. So the first line has it, it, it has in it, culture is the way we do things around here, right? So they say culture is taken to be like whatever you see going on in the company then, right? Like, um, I mean, for like good or bad, right? So for example, um, a company could have the best of rules, the best of safety guidelines then, right? They can have um, signs and, poli and policies that say um, safety is my first priority from last week's class. And they could even say things like hard hats are required beyond this point. But if you visit the company and no one is wearing hard hat, that does tell you something about the culture in the company. So. Culture is like what is practiced in the company on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Culture is um, something they say that could be intangible, but yet you can see evidence of it, right? So culture is, I'm trying to kind of create a scenario for you anyway. Culture is like that invisible attribute of safety. But if you look at it carefully, you can see evidence of it right for example i'll give you another one i mean a, a company could have said from last week class their policies that have zero accidents but as you enter a company you see on the accident board in the last 30 days they had five accidents now what does that say about the culture the policy says zero accidents but what you find going on around here or what is going on around there in the company is quite different from what the policy says, right? So on a layman's level, you could, you could understand it as that, that culture is whatever happens in the company on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, I wonder if I could give an example beside safety. An example could be, you know, like if you are visiting um, a government office in Trinidad and Tobago, if you're visiting a government office, 
the the idea is that you you cannot visit them after three o'clock, especially if you're going to do anything with cash is concerned, right? Because cash is normally closed out, and this is you know I guess sometimes universal anyway by three p.m. So even though the working day may end at four, it is just the culture in the company that cash closes at three. PM, right? So that is what goes on in the company or in the government, you know, services. If you were to go the half past three, they would say, well, didn't you know that cash, cash transactions close off at three? So that is like what cult here is. Cult here is even though your work day is seven to four or eight to four, the cult here is what happens in the company is that, you know, they would have stopped taking cash at three PM. I suppose I could go back to a safety example, but the time is going. That um, speed limits then, a speed limit in a company could be, you know, um, speed limit, let's say 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. But as you visit a company, you realize that everybody is speeding. So your obvious, like, like your obvious question could, like it could be, well, didn't this, the sign said 20 to 30? And then they would say, yes, it does. But in here, everybody drives at breakneck speed. That's just how, how it is. And that is what we mean by culture. On a, on a layman's term then, culture is something that it is intangible, but you see evidence of it by looking at the company, right? So if you can um, just think about that a bit, that, 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 that is a, a surface level definition of what culture is to help you understand what the, the class is all about, right? Um, the textbook definition, though, is that it is the product of the individual and group values, attitudes, perceptions, competencies, and pattern of behavior that determine an organization commitment, style, and ability to manage health and safety. So quite a mouthful. I mean, quite a mouthful there, but um, if I can show you two things in it. And the two things is not that you would not learn the definition, but to show the focus of it is that what they're trying to say here is that the way things are then, the way things are around here, right? The way that, you know, the sign would say 30 kilometers per hour, but everybody driving, you know, at 60 to 80. What is really responsible for that? There's two things responsible for the culture, and that's what the definition is, say that culture is really made up of you, the individual, right? So culture is the individual, which would be you. I'll draw a stick person for this one. Culture is made up of you, because you are in the company, as well as, if you look at the other part of it, as well as the group values, which is the company values, right? So you can think of that as, uh, I'll probably try to draw a building here, right? So what makes up, what makes up culture, right? Culture is made up of your values, but also what is the value of the group, right? You know, some companies refer to themselves as a group, for example, the Neil and Massey group of companies. I'll put Massey here, right? Um, you have uh, a whole range of companies that refer to themselves as a group. You have Unicoma, the Unicoma group of companies, right? So what they're saying is that culture is as much as your responsibility as that of the, the group that you come to work for, right? What does that mean? If you look at the rest of the definition, it says, it says what are your values and what are the values of the group? What is your attitude and what is the attitude of the group? What is your competencies? What is your pattern of behavior? And likewise, that of the group, right? And um, what you see here, if, if anybody making notes, is that um, you can normally write a little formula for this, right? The formula comes off from right there, that culture, right? Culture is really, if you look at the top definition, the product, right? Um, if you remember doing maths a little bit, um, mathematics, that is CXC maths, the word product means to multiply, right? It means to multiply. And the word multiply um, means to put together, right? So the word multiply means to put together. So when you put this into the definition, it says that culture is when you put together 
your values and that of the company, right? And that is a the formula says that if you, I'll put you here, at least the word you, if you have the correct value there, the correct attitude, and the company you work for have the correct attitude as well towards safety, what you're gonna find if these two work together in one, right? If these two work together, what are you gonna find? If your values is that as the same as the company and the company have a good value towards safety, what you're gonna end up with is what is called a positive health and safety culture in that um, if they say, you know, speed limit, you will agree with the speed limit. If they say PPE beyond this point, then you would of course wear PPE beyond this point. Once you have the togetherness, the, the, the product of, of, of your values and that of the company, if they are in some sort of alignment, you're gonna end up with a positive, this is a word positive here, a positive health and safety culture. Of course, as we know, and as we would have said just now, uh, most of the times, or should I say sometimes in some companies, you may find a disconnect between the two in that the companies may say wear PPE, but the individual, you know, doesn't want to wear it, right? And of course, vice versa is also true. Sometimes the person wants to advance the cause of safety by doing inspections and risk assessments, but the company would say, we don't have you know, the finances for that at this moment. So whenever you find um, you know, some sort of disagreement between the two, you end up with a negative safety culture, right? So this formula, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of key to understanding a lot of the questions Nibosh have with respect to culture, right? A lot of times um, they can ask questions like, and I know I kind of jump in the gun, but that's because I guess I have the formula up, right? They can ask a lot of times, like, what will be some individual factors that could hinder a positive safety culture? Meaning, what about you could result in a negative safety culture in the company? The answer is all here, it's all about your values your level of education, your attitude, your perception, your pattern of behavior, right? Like, are you a person that um, see the value that in following rules? A lot of people don't, right? I mean, especially, I guess if you're big and you're working, by that time you understand the purpose of rules. Little children do um, sometimes don't understand the purpose of rules. But likewise, if you were like a known rule breaker then, right? And it means like, I mean, you, you may not respect the company's rules. If they say smoking is allowed in the smoking area, but if you like, you are like a known rule breaker, you, like you may take every opportunity to probably just take a smoke wherever you feel to take a smoke. So whenever you find you have that, that, that disconnect between the two of these, here, like between the individual and the group, you end up with a negative safety culture, right? So um, before I leave this slide, there was, of course, a lot of reason why I stuck on this slide because this is a definition you'll have to know, and I wanted it to make sure that you know the definition, um, but also understand the definition. So knowing and understanding is two things. And so the knowing is what you have to learn, but the understanding is that culture in a company, because you are working for the company, it, it, it will be dependent on, 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 on you, right? Like, for example, what would have been your value what is your what is your um you know like what is you know like what would you do if nobody would be looking there right like would you do the right thing if no one was looking right so what is your values in the company as well as what is the company's values and if you have the two of them working together you do end up with a positive safety culture anyway beyond that like i said there's a lot of questions there which I think would be covered as we do the course itself, right? Um, but for now, you could learn the definition and then you could learn, like I said, um, from last week's class and all those class before, the stuff we had in it. Let me just um, try to clear that drawing there and I'll move to my second slide. They can ask if you have any questions as I try to clear that there in the meantime. Right, but for now it's just a simple question, which is, um, 
you know, what is the definition of cult? Yeah, as well as what could be, what about the individual could result in a negative safety cult? Yeah, that could have been a possible question as well. All right, I'll explain this one because we did a lot of explanation in the last one there. And this is a simple explanation. The whole idea here is that if a company have a good health and safety cult, yeah, they'll probably have less accidents. And that's all, that's all that this is saying, right? Once a company has a good health and safety cult, meaning that, the company and the individuals, they are working together to advance the cause of safety, meaning that every company say, you know, um, speed limit, they will drive by the speed limit, they say safety glasses are required, they will put on the safety glasses. Once you have that correlation, then like once you have a good safety culture, you normally find there is less accidents. You'll see that here, there's less human errors, there's less violation, and companies would not be performed strongly would reduce human failures or accidents. And again, all of this is on this slide, right? What is the correlation between a good safety culture and health and safety performance? Better motivated workers, fewer accidents, less fines from the HSC because they have their culture, they have a good safety culture, better reputation with customers and clients, right? So this is, um, one follows the other one then, a good safety culture, would normally lead itself to like a better company, right? Less accidents, better motivated workers, customers feeling happy, workers feeling happy because they're coming to work, they've, they've been valued and whatever have you, right? So once you have that, you know, we have a bunch of knockdown effects and in this case, good effects anyway, right? Um, so the next slide, as I mentioned before that, um, those things that we are looking at, like the number of accidents a company has and stuff, that is called the indicators. I have an indicator here, like a, like a speedometer, right? You have indicators of a company's health and safety culture. And likewise, those indicators could be good or that they can be bad, right? Um, so I'll say that again, if a company has a good safety culture, you know, we would find that they will have a low accident rate low absenteeism, low sickness rates, low staff turnover, better compliance with health and safety rules, um, less complaints about working conditions. So I did it on the other slide here. If you have a good health and safety culture, there's a lot of stuff you're gonna find coming down in the company, right? You have, um, what may promote a positive health and safety culture, you may have, um, you may have management commitment and leadership. And the reason why that is important is because remember we said that culture is made up of you as well as the group. So to have a good health and safety culture, the managers and them will have to lead, you know, that charge anyway. And, and what that means is simple. If, if, the, um, if the sign says speed limit 30 kilometers per hour, it means the managers have to drive in at that same speed as well, right? If they say, PPE beyond this point, the managers have to wear the PPE as well, right? So when you say leadership there, that's what that is all about. Um, health and safety should be part of the organization's strategy and business plan. They should provide information and instruction and training. Uh, as a part of good management, they should promote consultation, promote of health and safety issues and set and meet targets. All of that is going to result in a positive health and safety culture, right? This slide has in it what could result in a negative health and safety culture, right? So you spoke about that before. If, if the two parties, which is the, well, which is you and the company, if you all work together, and about a positive safety culture, but if, 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 it, if, one, if one entity doesn't seem to agree with the other entity, right? If the individual says, well, you know, these, safety glasses don't fit or they are uncomfortable or the speed limit is too low, we would drive the speed we want to drive, you'll find a negative safety culture there, right? But the, the slide is saying, what could promote a negative safety culture, right? What could promote a negative safety culture? They have here, the company, if it's being reorganized, company reorganization, right? In a case where a company may be going through some sort of change, safety then may be put, you know, on the back burners then. Safety may not be seen as priority because the company may be going through some sort of change and that may affect the culture. Workers may not know if they have a job 
you know, if their job is going to change. And whenever you have those level of uncertainties, it may lead to a negative safety culture. Second point, a lack of confidence in the organization's objectives and methods. Uncertainties here by itself. Management decision that prejudice mutual trust or lead to mixed signals regarding commitment, right? So that's kind of a bit of a mouthful, but all that means though is that um, in respect to the managers, like they say one thing and they mean something else, right? So if you have that, seeing that culture, if I can get back to Mark, see that culture was made up of the group, right? Culture was made up of the group and the group is really the company as well as you, right? So if, um, if the company would have given you the idea, you know, like you could get away with something, you know, I mean, yes, they say hard hats are required beyond this point, but if the managers make a decision then, that's what this is all about, that, that shows mixed signals, right? So if the group says, you know, the speed limit was 30, but then the manager say, you know, you all could go faster. You all can probably go up to about 60 to 80, right? So that will lead to mixed signals and uncertainty, uncertainty in the company. And that does create a certain level of, um, a certain level of um, confusion with regards, to, with, with, with regards to culture there. Right? You can take out many examples. For example, like inspections. If a company is accustomed to doing inspections, right, for the morning, right every morning they are custom doing inspections but then you know on various mornings the managers come out and say well then don't bother inspect the forklift you you can't go and use it just as is that does create mixed signals regarding what they really want and then that could lead to a negative safety culture in the long run seeing that the forklift may not have been inspected and that may have resulted in some sort of accident you know on the shop floor anyway right so that's the idea. Um, that's the idea with these slides anyway, that you can have, um, I'm not sure to clear that screen, right? That you can have things that result in a positive safety culture. And at the same time, you, you can have things that result in a negative safety culture, right? And um, uh, I suppose, um, you know, management being a big part of it, could be, you know, responsible for giving those mixed signals anyway. All right, uh, moving on. All right, so this one, um, how does your peers influence the health and safety culture? So this one should be easy enough. Um, I guess if you have worked it, it'd be easy enough. If, if um, in a company, and this is normal for most companies, if you all have um, morning meetings, right? Um, companies normally have morning meetings like half past seven every morning. If in the morning meetings, you know, like um, there is some sort of excitement then or enthusiasm where these meetings are concerned and workers, um, workers look forward to it and then you may not be looking forward to it, but then you hear everybody say, you know, we will discuss it in safety meeting. And there's some sort of excitement and enthusiasm for the safety meeting that may influence your behavior to attend the safety meetings then, right? And if any one of you all, I know we have people that work in this class, there are also persons that, um, that, that go to safety meetings and they sleep, right? They go to the safety meeting half seven in the morning and um, they walk with a pair of, um, you know, dark, darkers on, shades then, dark uh, glasses on, and they put these glasses on and uh, they sleep so then you, who may want to take part in a safety meeting or bring up an issue, you realize that all your peers, they don't really seem to care about the safety meeting, that that may rub off on you then, right? Likewise, sooner or later, you may just follow what they are doing anyway. So that's what this slide is all about, that our peers influence us in many ways, one of which can be our safety behavior. The overall attitude of the workforce can be a driving force to influence other workers especially those with a dominant or inspiring leadership style. And every company has someone like that. Every company has, um, has you know, that the person might not be the most educated, but they are the most dominant. And uh, whatever they do, it almost seems as if they have followers anyway, right? 
So imagine if the person that is dominant or is inspiring, imagine if they are of the opinion that the safety meeting is just a waste of time, that safety is just a formality, it's just a waste of time, let's go half past seven, right? Um, if, if you do have that belief though, what I'm saying is that the rest of workers, right, that dominant person may have already spoken to you and said, it, it don't make sense raise anything in the safety meeting because they don't really take any action here, right? If that is the overall consensus, then, then that may influence you not to take part in the safety meeting. Granted, we said that safety is a combination of you and your company, right? So if you have been taken out of the game then by your peers, then what is left then, you know, to have a positive um, or, you know, a productive safety meeting, right? So it is therefore that the belief and perception of the group would soon also be that of the individual worker, right? So this is, I want to say this is um, the theory of most, you know, or the theory of many, meaning that um, whatever the crowd believes, we normally find most of the workers believe it, right? Uh, to be the one that doesn't believe that would mean that you are the one that is going to be seen as I guess the square one, you are the one that's going to be seen as, you know, the troublemaker then, right? So this is just the theory that, that uh, whatever the group believes or whatever your peer believes, you will soon be practicing whatever they say and whatever they do as well. So we hope that that is good. But as in the picture here, I guess with Homer Simpson, um, most of the times, those um, dominant persons normally tend to defeat a safety, you know, a safety meeting or some aspect of safety anyway. And then that does, you know, trickle down. The culture does trickle down to the rest of the workers. And I talking from experience, I guess that many times you find that workers and companies, they don't wear their hard hats. They drive the forklift without the seat belt. They speed beyond the speed limit. They smoke where they're not supposed to smoke. And one of the reasons for doing that is because everybody else is doing it right? Everybody else is driving at that speed. Everybody else is smoking just around, you know, where the wall is at. Nobody is going to the designated smoking area. So your peers do tend to have an influence on you. And of course, Sam, I'll probably throw in this here because I know a lot of us are young in safety. Um, to be really a good safety, you have to have some backbone, right? Just in case, I don't know if anybody here would actually, I know we have workers in safety here like Nathaniel and we have people like Reddy and Marcus and stuff, right? But the job of a safety, right, is one in which you may have heard people say it before, but the job of safety is one in which you are not everybody's friend, right? You know, I guess the custodian, the facilities manager could be everybody's friend. Um, you know, I think maybe the accountant could be everybody's friend because as you want to do it, you know, like, like your pay slips and stuff. But the safety position is one in which you are not everybody's friend. And if you're young and you haven't worked at in safety, that's something you have to know, right? The good news though, as I've seen, you know, we do have um, a lot of um, female students as well. The good news though is that I believe, and from experience here, that the young ladies tend to have a better, you know, experience as a safety than a male, right? Our workers are more likely to give a male safety advisor more problems then than a female safety advisor, right? I suppose that probably just has to do with, um, I guess, the sexes anyway, right? Male and female, right? Of course, um, I think I have found it to be so that if there are other females in a company, they probably tend to give the females more trouble as well if you are safe, a female safety advisor, right? But I have a lot of them out there. And um, I just let you know, if you haven't worked in the field yet, you do have to be bold. You have to be a bit loud. I know that I mean, loud doesn't mean loud, but loud means stern. And you do have to have a backbone to stand up against, you know, um, the opinions that that may not be uh, your opinion in terms of health and safety. Do, do you know, as I said, you know, this is lesson four, right? But do you know as a safety that if, I think we covered this in lesson one to that, if a job is seen to be unsafe, right? If a job is seen to be high risk, 
you have to stop it, not the managers, not the CEO, the safety have to stop it. And if you don't understand that, what that probably may mean that you may have to stop the managers and have the backbone to actually do that, to stop the managers or your boss from production because the risk associated with a job may be seen to be high, right? I can give you stories wholly, but I wouldn't, but just take it from me, right? I have a lot of students who had that experience and some of them is not a nice experience, but they did it anyway, right? And that is the job of a city because in the end, right, you do want to save lives in the end. I think Jim Miller had an experience like that, if I remember correct. In the end, you want to save lives right um so you want to report the safety incidents might not be the best thing you want to stop production might not be the best thing for the company but that is what i mean by you do have to have a certain level of backbone to stand up for that right anyway right the good news though if i, if I could train some good news is that is that the good news is that um a lot of companies value you more if you do that a lot of companies look at you more and you know you you may not think about that you may think that they see you as a troublemaker but a lot of them value you more and they probably will hire you you know more because they know that you would not you know put up with the popular belief then that you have the stamina that you have the backbone to correct a manager that who could be speeding suppose it was a manager that was speeding right the same 30 kilometers power Suppose it was the manager that wasn't wearing the safety glasses that they had had, right? It is your job as a safety to put them in place. And believe it or not, the higher ups, the persons who are higher up to your manager, when they see that, they normally do tend to recognize that you are one of the better ones anyway, right? Um, I would have shared a story with you with one of my other students, but I wouldn't, right? I was just telling her that, um, that that student that I'm talking about that, that did something like that, today, um, that student is the chief safety in Atlantic LNG, right? A student that had the backbone. He was at least scared, right? When he, um, well, I, was, I would say it in Trinidad language anyway, when he shut down the company, right? That is one of the, um, the, the powers given to a worker in Atlantic LNG, but they don't normally use it. But this particular student, Felt that something was unsafe, and uh, you know he would have, you know, caused operations to cease anyway. And uh, he was quite scared because he told me that um, he didn't know if they were going to fire him. But the higher ups, and this was about ten years ago, but today, like I guess that the higher ups would have taken notice of that. And then today, he is the chief uh, main safety manager for Atlantic Energy in terms of safety anyway. Right? Anyway. Hopefully I drove on that point well enough there for the young people amongst us, right? So peers can influence health and safety behavior by being present for safety meetings. A lot of these we discussed already. Personally wearing PPE, reporting accidents and incidents, effectively communicating with managers, taking part in inspections if needed, taking an active role in safety campaigns, and we talk about it, the last one a lot, stopping on safe work and insisting that it's done in a safe manner, right? All right, so improving health and safety culture. I, I said I might not have gotten to this, but we did get to 3.2. And um, let me see if I could probably just uh, try to interject a past paper somewhere here, right? So I don't want to go too fast. Um, with it, because this is a bunch of explanation, but um, I'll probably interject a passive right around, right around here, right? So let me just reach this slide and I'll mention a passive, but to you all, maybe we could um, come in and discuss it a bit, and um, that'll be it for today's session, right? So improving health and safety culture, and again, just keep in the back of your mind, I don't want to draw it back again, but when they say improving culture, you have to consider two things. You have to consider yourself and the company, right? Because culture is made up of two things. If you look at this slide, you'll see this one focuses on management, right? So um, uh, to improve culture, um, one way or one method of doing that 
is trying to incorporate managers then, right? They say senior managers are culture drivers, and so their commitment to health and safety is essential, meaning that if you remember the formula, you cannot do it by yourself, right? Poor little you, poor little safety cannot do, you know, change the company by themselves. But if they are being supported from management, then, you know, workers may see that. And I want to give you some real examples here. Workers may see that, and then that may change the workers' perception then that had had must be worn, right? So what I wanted to kind of bear in mind here that um, these slides are written as if, it, it has fancy words in it and I call it your drivers, but for exam, you have to see what that means, right? So senior managers are called your drivers and so their commitment to health and safety is essential. So what this means, I think if you want to get like a physical example, is like, um, it's kind of like they have to, take part, the senior managers have to be involved, right? So I would want to say then that, um, not to sure if this may be too much of a deeper example, but like um, if they are to be seen as culture drivers, I think one way that a senior manager could do that is if you want to take a little note here, maybe is that they can personally post Right? They, can post, they, they can personally host a safety meeting. Now that may seem simple, but it's not in the companies anyway, right? The safety meetings, the HSC meetings are normally seen to be the responsibility of the safety, right? But see if you can get the pity of trying to paint that um, if every morning, you know, the workers come to a company, and I'll draw some stick figures here, right? If every morning they're accustomed to seeing the HSE person, which would be you, this is you here, right? Trying your best, you know, for the sake of safety. If every morning they come and they're seeing you, eventually they may get the idea that you can't really have that because remember you are not, you are the HSE, you are, they're supposed to be heads, right? The heads of persons, right? So this is the HSE. But, um, you know, the HSE is not really signing your paycheck. So there's only so much you could do. For example, if an issue was to come up, let's say the crowd says that we want to purchase some new PPE, our boots, you know, seem to be losing, you know, its integrity, the grip, the sole and whatever have you. But then at the end of the day, you, as a safety, could only hear those complaints. So what I'm saying is that one of the ways the managers could be seen as the culture drivers is that what about if they themselves would show up with you and host a safety meeting, right? Again, if you're in the safety field, you know that this is a radical idea because you don't normally see the CEO then, right? And the HSC is over this person. So, Mr. Patel, Patel CEO. You don't normally see the CEO in a safety meeting. But that's what this is all about. If you wanted to improve culture, then why not? Why not have the CEO come to work that morning, 7 30? Most of them don't come that time anyway, right? But why not have them come there 7 30 a.m. and host the meeting, right? Um, anybody could probably tell me, I know all the mics are kind of but anybody could tell me, like, what would be the, the crowd perception if they were to see that? What do you think would be some of the thoughts going through your mind or the mind of the workers in a company? If when you come to the normal meeting, which every day is going to be 7 to for some companies, but then, you know, Monday morning, you, you come to the meeting and you see the CEO, what is the first thing going through your mind? Anybody? Raise up pay. <laughs> Raise up pay. Well, anybody is? Well, yeah. Right, very good. Yeah, a lot of people will think, okay, we're going to get laid off. But imagine, no, I actually did this, and that's what I'm telling you. I actually did this with Neil and Marcy. I was a safety, and I got to see you cut off, you come to the meeting. And people, honestly, they thought that they were going to get fired, right? People thought that, um, yeah, that they were going to be laid off. Um, the CEO at the point in time, his name was Stuart Sanka. Stuart Sanka, right? Um, a, a young guy, he was a bit 
he was a bit mixed, right? He had, um, I guess, uh, he was a bit mixed with US as well. He was a mixed citizen anyway. But um, tall, deep voice. So like when he spoke, everybody listened, and, um, you know, more or less anyway. And um, when when he was at the meeting, I mean, the, the, it was like silent. You could have heard a pin drop. But the thing is, um, Stuart Tanka did not talk about raise of pay. He did not talk about layoff, right? I had, you know, told him what to say and everything. We had a discussion before, so what the focus of this meeting would have been. And he just spoke about safety. And at the end of the meeting, every one of the crowd here, they left the meeting thinking, they left the meeting thinking, way, I mean, must he taking safety seriously now? But the point was, they were always taking safety seriously. The only thing that changed was on this morning, instead of the HSC saying what would have normally been said, it was said by the CEO. You understand how that would have changed the culture? The fact that the workers are now getting the perception that they're taking safety seriously. Now, what it had ready to do with senior management saying it, and not really the normal HSC person saying it. It was the same kind of meeting, we just talk about safety issues, but everybody left there thinking they are taking safety seriously now. And the only reason why people would have thought no was because it was the CEO that was saying it. But all the time, the rules and the policies were always there anyway, right? So I think you understand that definition of um, how a senior manager could act as a culture driver. And like I went on to explain this one, so that you know that the phrase culture driver is not just a phrase now, but it is something that the managers have to do to influence culture. You can't just say for exam that senior managers are culture drivers, but what did they do? Did they take part in an inspection? Did they um, host a meeting? Another simple one, I show those of us who work in with know what I'm talking about. Another simple one is that a lot of times the managers don't wear PPE. Right? Everyone is required to wear the coverall and the hard hat and the boots and the glasses that maybe get into a machine shop or a type of warehouse then, right? But if a manager wants to come in, the sign says PP beyond this point, but then he could come in with a soft shoes. So sometimes, and what I'm trying to say is that the workers may look at that and they would say, well, isn't everybody to wear safety glasses? How come the manager could come in without safety glasses? How come he could come in without the proper footwear, right? And what we're trying to say is that being a culture driver means that the manager themselves is the one to put on the PPE and then to lead by example then, right? I, I always remember, and I just have to be careful in how I give my, my examples here, right? I, I always remember I went to a company right, in library to do some training, right? And um, this was a, um, trying to pick my words, I don't try to sell at all, but it was a big company, right, that had contracts at BP and stuff and um, a lot of high-risk work like welding and sharp objects, iron, lots of iron, right, iron parts, bits and whatever have you huge on a huge scale if we're talking about well and like a platform anyway and i remember in that company um the safety met me by the gate which most people do anyway you know when they hear you know, that they invited somebody to come to do a presentation or the train the safety met me by the gate um however though the person was in a slippers the person was in a slippers like um, a house slippers or a yard slippers, right? And true to form, I won't tell you all of it, but true to form in the training, we were training people and the safety wasn't there at the point of time, but that came up, that came up where the workers mentioned, you know, well, the safety um, normally is on the compound with a slippers on. And I had to say, well, but I noticed that as well. You know, and the rule is that the PP be on this point, but how could the safety be in the company and really not like in her office or the office per se, but in the yard with these huge welding operations going on, metal and, and whatever have you, you know, um, throughout the whole company. 
but at the same time has a rubber slippers on, right? So that is what I mean by when I say that when you are writing this up, if it was, you know, how could managers show their commitment to health and safety? You said that they could be called your drivers, but make sure and do what I am doing here. Go on to give an example, right? I just give you about three there. One is still on the slide. Safety meeting is there. I mentioned the thing about the glasses and I, this example now with somebody where, you know, like inappropriate footwear is also one as well, right? If the organization treat health and safety as a shop floor task, meaning as like a, just at the lower levels, then the organization will fail to manage health and safety, which will influence culture. The culture then has to start at the top, senior management. It can't just be for the ground level workers alone, right? Health and safety policy and procedures should be endorsed by senior management so as to engage them, right? So um, let me just play that there. Oh, almost time to finish anyway. Right, um, so if you have any questions as we kind of maneuver these, the, the cursor back and forth here, right? Um, so I don't know if you want to do a better review for today. We kind of covered a lot. Um, there was some passive buzz inside here, but I may have to, um, I may have to stop it. But let me just try to read out these two last slides here. It's about the same thing anyway. So promoting health and safety standards by leadership and management. So visible commitment to health and safety motivates employees towards their commitment. For example, the managers taking a walk about or a walk around. Managers should practice what they preach. Now, if you're writing this back, for example, please put an example of that, right? Simple examples, if they say, safety glasses must be worn, then they should have to wear it as well. Management should praise good performance and be as visible as possible when they do it. Health and safety should be part of the agenda in management meetings. Again, this is a big one. I can talk on this whole day. Um, I am sure some of you all know that uh, companies have meetings all the time and they talk at length uh, about finances. So the idea here is that one of the things to talk about is also safety in the agenda when you're planning a meeting you give safety like a 10, 15 minutes as well in the management meetings, not in the safety meeting, if you can get this a bit, right? This is promoting leadership, right? From managers and by managers anyway. So appropriate use of disciplinary measures can also be used as a tool for promoting health and safety standards on the part of the managers, right? So managers can take an active role in workplace inspections. They can, most of them don't, but this is the idea of today's class. Full cooperation with fire drills and other emergency training exercises. Again, if you have not worked, you probably realize that that may be a little bit difficult. Most of the times in a fire drill, the last person to leave is a manager, right? CEO and managers don't like it at all, especially if, um, you know, I mean, like, if, if they were with a client, if they were with a client, they may not appreciate that you, you know, that you were the one to pull a drill in the middle of their meeting with a client, right? So they tend to give a little bit of issues. So it's not just the ground level workers, it's also the top, the top managers do tend to give a bit of issues in regard to safety as well. Identifying and keeping up to date with legal requirements, such as the HSW Act and the Management of Health and Safety Work Regulations, 1999 Regulation 3. You probably don't know that is it, but that law says this Regulation 3 says to do a risk assessment. If only could write that in, it will save you some trouble in lesson four anyway, right? And the use of competent person, this is where I said I wanted to end it, that companies must use competent person. So I'll stop it right at competence here for next week. So we'll take it from next week here. I, however, do want it. Um, sometimes I have past papers here, right? But so, so there's one here, but I don't think we covered this as yet today. At least we didn't get to reach this, right? Um, and there's often a lot more past papers as you go through the lesson itself, right? Um, I think um, I think I'd given you all a past paper last week question. I don't think I got much, much responses on that. At least I didn't check the last piece of it. The question was, um, the one from last week was, I think one person did it, which was Marcus. I think it was one person, right? Um, to identify eight arrangements or something like that in the health and safety policy, right? So um, 
seen it, I do have another one planned, but we did discuss one here. I wanted to go and give you, but you see, we just did that. So I don't see the point in giving it again, which is uh, like eight things a manager could do to influence cultures. I, I wouldn't do that. I don't know if anyone could just do this person for me, for homework though. So what I want for this one, right? You, you, I want to I get with this one. We said that culture is a group and the individual, but really today's lesson kind of more focused on the group. You saw a lot of things that managers could do, right? So I did this already. So I'm not going to give it that one. I want to give you, maybe if you could identify eight items about you that influence culture. So what is eight items about you? Some of it was on the slides already. Right, but you can use your books and see if you come up with all the answers. Eight items about a person. You can think of yourself. And we already look at some answers. For example, like your like your attitude would be an answer, right? Your level of education would be an answer. But what is eight items about you? If I get a study with well, why were you? Eight items about you that could um, influence or promote. Um, a positive health and safety culture. So what is eight things about you? If you can do this one for me for next week, I can send it before anyway. Um, like I said, I'm still missing some homework from, maybe some of you all did send it because I normally do look at stuff on a Friday. If you sent anything for me yesterday, I would not have looked at it. I normally look at Friday stuff on a Sunday because Friday I'm preparing for um, these three classes we have on a Saturday anyway. Plus, um, a education class anyway, so that's actually four, right? So I could give you a start here. I have about 30 seconds again. <laughs> Eight items about you. So you have like, for example, your age could be an answer. It could influence safety culture, your age, right? Your, your attitude. And you could probably want to put this in a sentence, right? It's, it's all over the textbook and it is kind of on the slide. But we didn't get to do the individual today. Today's class more or less focused on the group. So I didn't see fit to give you one for the group, right? Because that's what we spoke about management commitment and hosting meetings and wearing safety glasses and stuff. That's kind of all said already, right? So if we could complete this, you could probably get six more, six more items about you that could influence safety culture and then write this one up for next week. Well, sometime, anytime you finish your Senate, I'll be able to give you a comment on it. Um, any questions for me? I would close the recording there now and we leave just for a time.